This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Good afternoon. I should say good afternoon. My name is Jules Winterson. Uh, I'm at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, in fact. Uh, and it's my very pleasant duty to uh, introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Liversley. Um, and first to thank her and thank you for braving the elements and actually getting here without getting blown away. Um, thank goodness we don't have to cope with an underground strike for getting home, um, which I thought was going to be the major challenge of the evening. Um, this lecture is part of a, a series of research training lectures organised by the School of Advanced Study, as I'm sure you know, on quantitative methodologies, uh, which I know very little about and have some difficulty in actually saying it. Um, next one is in a week's time, um, and you'll probably have seen the, the poster uh, with the whole series on the back. Um, Mark Easton from the BBC next week, 19th of February, yes. Um, we're very fortunate uh, to welcome as our speaker today, Professor Liversley, who's you will have seen on this sheet, so I, I won't go through the whole thing, but uh, she's head of the School of Social Science and Public Policy at King's College and Professor of Social Statistics. Um, and particularly relevant to her talk, I think, she was Director of Statistics at UNESCO, where she established its Institute for Statistics, and I think there'll be an international flavour to the talk. So, the title of the talk, as you see there, why do statisticians count? I managed to say that. Um, and uh, Good, okay, thank you. you. It's nice to have a, a nice little select group. So, um, given that it's a select group, please don't think that you've got to wait for me to finish my lecture before we can have discussion or questions. So, you know, if at any point during what I say, you want to stop me and ask questions. I assume that's okay, even though we're filming, isn't it? Okay, uh, fine. So um, I'd much rather it was of relevance to you um, and what you want to hear about. And I'm in really um, great company in this series of talks. I was with Adrian Smith this morning, and he was telling me that he's coming soon. And uh, uh, John Pullinger, a good friend of mine, has just been. So it's it's a uh, great company. Um, so, I'm going to talk, uh, yes, from an international perspective. I want to say something about what a statistician does, and in particular what a statistician does in an international role. And I want to talk a bit about what I call the politics of numbers, some of the problems in terms of getting accurate information. So. Um, so that's the broad context of, of what I'm going to talk about. But it doesn't matter if I don't get through all my slides, you know, you're welcome to have them anyway, and we can go off into other discussions if you, uh, if you want. So, where are we? So, slideshow from the beginning. So, I guess the, the underlying premise of what I'm talking about is that Statistics are fundamental for evidence-based policy. Um, and by that, I mean they're, they're important for helping us to make well-informed decisions about policies, about programs and projects by putting the best available evidence from research at the heart of policy development and implementation. I think it's really important that you think about statistics being used at all stages, right from this, the, the very early stages where you're trying to identify what the problem is, you're doing options analyses, maybe piloting some policies, then you're going through to implementing, and then you hopefully are evaluating, seeing how effective the policies have been. So right throughout the process. And it's really important that we recognize that it's about being explicit um, what's what's known, but also what isn't known, and where we have where we have gaps in our knowledge, or where we're less certain, um, and that's really critical because that helps us 
to develop better information systems for the future, at least know the basis on which we're making decisions. So, you know, my argument is that statistics are fundamental for evidence-based policy. What I'm wanting to support is evidence-based policy rather than policy-based evidence, where we decide on the policy and then we root around to try and get evidence that supports it. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about how we turn that rhetoric into reality and how statisticians help in that process. So the importance of ensuring evidence-based policy, yes, but also I want to talk a little bit about statistics as a tool of empowerment um, and how statistics can give a voice to the poor, people who are on the margins of society, um, don't necessarily have a way of, of actually getting their voices heard. Um, and I want to, to touch on the important issue that we need to, to measure what matters. Um, and I get worried when increasingly we're in um, environments and cultures where what, uh, what matters is what's measured as opposed to measuring what matters. Okay, so people focus on what data they've got instead of actually concentrating on what's really important. I think those of us working in higher education worry about this a great deal, that we're often driven by what's measured, what's measurable. So I want to talk about how we, how we can do this and some of the problems in doing it. This is human empowerment. One of my heroes is Amartya Sen. Um, and he, he's a great advocate of, of high quality statistics. And he talks about the success of an economy and a society not being separated from the lives of the, the members of that society, the lives that they're able to lead. And talks about us not only valuing living well and satisfactorily, but also having control over our lives. And to me, having a good grasp of data and being able to understand that data and call governments to account, or to call policy makers to account, institutions to account, is a really important part of empowerment. Um, so that's what I mean by empowering through statistics. For many years ago, when I was working in the UN, I was working in Ghana, and um, we had the situation where money from the government for schools was disappearing. It was just evaporating somewhere in the system. It wasn't getting to the teachers, the head teachers, who needed it for running the schools. And uh, we set up an information system whereby every school had delivered to it, and it used to be pinned on, on the outside of the school, a record of what the government had assigned financially to that school. So that parents, governors of the school, uh, even in some cases children, teachers and so on, could ask questions about that money. So transparency is really important. Of course, the value of statistics to society, you can't just assert it, you've got, you've got to demonstrate it. And, um, this is a quote, I'll leave it with you rather than reading it all out. I, you're welcome to the slides. So, um, it's a quote from the U UK Statistics Commission, um, <coughs> now the UK Statistics Authority, it's changed its name. Um, and it talks about one of the problems that we have, that uh, we know about the costs of statistics, we don't know or understand enough about the value of them. Um, I often laugh, we have a saying in, in English about the, the cobbler, you know, the cobbler who makes shoes, the cobbler's children always have no shoes. And statisticians ought to be really, really good at measuring the value of what they produce, but actually, we're really poor at it. So we understand the costs of data, we don't really understand what are the costs of not having data. And it's an area where I think um, increasing attention is being turned to, to
to this, but it's really, we need a lot more work in this area. Um, I currently chair the, the European Statistical Advisory Committee, and there we have good data on costs, we have good data on issues to do with response burden, the burden of, of collecting information from people, but very, very little on, on the value of it. Um, a prerequisite for evidence-based policy is that the data must be trustworthy. They have to be of good quality. Um, I think that's obvious, but it's not enough. They, they also have to be trusted. So um, data have to be trustworthy and trusted. If they aren't trusted, they won't be used. There's fights about the data rather than about the issues, whereas we want data to inform um, the very issues we're debating. And we want data to be the currency of public debates. Um, I'm going to show you a slide in a minute about the extent to which uh, statistics are, are trusted in this country. So you might be thinking about this issue of trust. Um, of course, evidence is sometimes resisted. And there's this lovely quote, I assume, from, uh, from Keynes with his tongue in his cheek, I assume he wasn't entirely serious, that there's nothing a government hates more than to be well informed, for it makes the process of arriving at decisions much more complicated and difficult. It's easier just to decide what you want to do, not to have to contend with information. But uh, although it is a bit tongue-in-cheek, there is some truth in this. And I often talk about, uh, with apologies to Al Gore, uh, inconvenient truths. Um, that governments prefer good news stories, Bad news stories uh, are delayed or, or buried. Um, in good statistical systems, you have um, all data has to be published. So you publish the fact that you've collected data, and therefore you have to then subsequently publish the data. So you can protect in that respect. So the data has to be published, but there are still ways around it. Um, you know, you wait for a, uh, something like a royal wedding. Um, and then you publish the data that shows that the um, uh, inequalities in relation to access to the health system in this country are increasing. And that is exactly what happened. Um, so uh, data that is uncomfortable for the government of the day um, can be uh, delayed or buried or they hope that that uh, nobody will notice when the data are produced. Um, those of us who uh, watch for these issues about trying to protect the integrity of official statistics and so on, have tried to overcome this. And one of the ways in which we've tried to overcome it is by all government statistics have a publication date announced in advance of us knowing what the data are going to show. And we've also been working really hard, I don't know if uh, John Pullinger talked to you about this, on the whole list about who has prior access to data and what happens in relation to that prior access, what they can do, um, how, how long that prior access is. We've been trying to shorten and shorten the prior access. So I have a lovely story about this. When some years ago I was working um, in the European, in the international community, and I was at a meeting where the Director General of Statistics for Canada was talking about access to uh, official data in Canada, and he said that the data were published at um, 9.30 in the morning, and the date was pre-released, and um, the Minister, Prime Minister, um, had access to these data one hour before, but only an hour before in a closed room. They weren't allowed to have access to the press. Um, and so he was talking about how this was a protection in terms of the integrity of official statistics. And the head of statistics for Russia at the time asked to speak, and he said he was really interested in hearing this from the head of statistics of Canada. You know, his friend obviously had wonderful systems in Canada. 
but he was puzzled by something. What did he do if the minister concerned or the prime minister wished to change the data? <laughs> and it just showed you the different cultures. Now, one of the things that we have in this country is that there is prior access, um, usually 24 hours access, usually quite a large number of people have access. And one of the problems is those of you who listen to the Today programme on Radio 4 will hear the government minister say, well, statistics to be released later today are expected to show. That's an indirect leak of the statistics. The minister is actually getting ahead of the game in order to, to put their spin on the data first. So these things, these things matter. You know, some of these statistics are really important in terms of market sensitivity and so on, but also how the public hears them and whether the public hears the political spin first matters. We also have the problem of being focused on populism and horizons being much shorter than those of statisticians. It takes a long time to collect high quality data. Um, and so we've got all these sorts of difficulties in terms of producing certainly official statistics that are, uh, have integrity. And there are lots of ways um, in which we can try to protect and build trust, the autonomy of the people <coughs> carrying out the work. Who, who actually appoints the director of statistics? Under what conditions can he, be, he or she be removed? Um, you don't want the situation that there is at the moment in Argentina where the, um, many of the official statisticians have been removed from their, their positions, um, are unemployed in the past, disappeared, um, because they were producing data that was uncomfortable for the government. So the autonomy, the, the power of the statisticians, statistical legislation, independent statistics boards, codes of conduct can be important, particularly in relation to the relationships with professional societies, breaches of any of the codes being investigated, I mentioned the appointment of the senior statisticians, um, ensuring that users get to, to uh, help set the agenda so that you can't have um, the Margaret Thatcher moment where Margaret Thatcher said there was no such thing as society, she didn't want any data collected on social class. You can't have that because uh, users set the agenda. Um, audits and audit bodies reporting to Parliament uh, rather than the government of the day. Um, we don't have all of these in many, many countries of the world. And, you know, I have been in meetings with directors of statistics where they have told me in confidence that they. Um, their family is under threat, they are under threat because they have to produce the GDP data that the government wishes to see, the unemployment data that the government wishes to see, and so on. So you have to be conscious that statistics almost, it's, it's almost this really difficult position where if they're not valuable and not used, nobody bothers to, to manipulate them. If they're valuable and used and called used to call people to account, then there's incentives to manipulate. And of course, as a statistician, I want data to be valuable and to be used, but I don't want them to be manipulated. I want them to be policy relevant, but I don't want them to be politically interfered with in any way. So I said I'd show you some data on trust. Now this is um, far too detailed for you to be able to see all of it, but um, this is a question that's asked by the OECD in a regular survey, um, and this is from, I think it's from three years ago, so uh, they've done the survey just recently. Um, so we'll be waiting for the new data. But this shows um, people's answers, general population survey, answers to the question about whether they uh, tend to trust or tend not to trust um, official statistics, data from the government. Um, and the blue is tend to trust, the red is tend not to trust, and the, the grey is, is don't know. And 
Up at this end, with the highest levels of trust, we've got the Netherlands, Denmark, Finland, Luxembourg. Um, down this end, bottom, the UK, France, Hungary. Um, it will be interesting when they repeat this survey. I expect Italy to fall even more. I expect Greece to fall. Um, we will probably, in a comparative sense, therefore, rise slightly. Now, as a statistician, should I be worried about that? Um, well, I said I wanted people to trust statistics. So I am worried from that perspective. But I actually want to be in a society where people are sceptical. And people, people actually question what they're given rather than just accepting it. So, you know, some of these countries up here, it's fabulous because they've got high quality statistical systems that are well trusted. But we've actually got a high quality statistical system in many, many respects, but it isn't trusted. And so this, this you know, bit of a conflict there really as to whether, whether this is <coughs> damaging in terms of uh, the environment for statistics in this country. Um, let me move on. I said I wanted to measure what mattered. And we need to, to guard against what I call measuring what, what isn't, uh, sorry, what can't be measured isn't real. Economists have come to feel what can't be measured isn't real, is where I've taken this from. Um, and there's a danger with the measurement culture that we pay excessive attention to what we can easily measure at the expense of what's difficult or impossible to measure quantitatively, even though it might be fundamental. So it's really a plea for um, informed, sound, responsible use of, of statistical information in a context and accepting that we can't there are lots of things we can't measure. And I don't know if anybody has shown you this lovely quote from Robert Kennedy. Have you seen it before? Um, and it talks about the gross national product doesn't allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, the joy of their play. It doesn't include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short except that which makes life worthwhile. Um, I actually am a great believer in, in good quality uh, GMP and GDP data, and I would be horrified if we didn't have high quality data of that sort. But I have a lot of sympathy with this issue about putting the data in context. And a few years ago, yeah, I don't know if anybody's told you about the Sarkozy Sen Commission, the uh, Stiglitz Sen Commission set up by Sarkozy. No? So a few years ago, uh, Sarkozy, um, because he was concerned that most of the measures that were being developed in the EU were economic measures. Um, and very much being driven by, by Germany, um, that it was undervaluing the quality of life in France. And he, he would argue that the quality of life in France is extremely high, and that just narrowly focusing on a small set of economic data is misleading. And he set up a commission under Joe Stiglitz and Imata Sen's leadership. And they produced a great report that you, you can read on the web. So if you look up the Stiglitz-Sen report, you'll find it. And it's arguing for the importance of us having a whole range of data, not just economic data, but social data. It's arguing for us to actually understand inequalities within our societies not just to focus on averages, but to actually look at distributions, to look at what situation the poor are in, how they have, uh, their life quality has 
improved or diminished over time. It also argues that a lot of official statistics are far too simplistic, even within, say, a household, they assume that the distribution is evenly, uh, evenly spread, often ignores gender issues, for example. Um, it's, it's a good report, and it's influenced a lot. Um, you can argue that a lot of the financial problems that we're now confronting are due to the fact that we have been steering our countries using too small a set of economic indicators. Um, they don't go so far in their report to do that, but I, I think that um, other people following up on their work have done exactly that and have argued that case. And I'm rem reminded some years ago, um, I was uh, living in Addis Ababa, working for the UN, um, and it was during uh, famine, terrible famine. They, they uh, had a famine, this is six years ago, it was just before I joined Kings. Absolute desperate famine in, in uh, Addis, in Ethiopia at that time, because um, although they'd had rain, it had come um, in deluge and had wiped away most of the crops. Um, uh, Ethiopia is a very high country and they have a lot of winds and they'd had winds and rain, tell us about it at the moment, and that had destroyed the crops. So whereas previous famines had been caused by drought, this was actually caused by a different uh, climate problem. But the impact of this was de devastating, absolutely devastating. Um, and uh, the IMF were in the country, and the IMF made a recommendation that uh, one of the ways in which Ethiopia could build its um, economic position was by copying Kenya in terms of setting up a flower industry. You know that if you buy red roses for your loved one on Friday, they will have come from Kenya at this time of the year. Um, and so there was huge investment in the flower industry. This is a country without access to water, where the people are desperately poor, where nothing grew because it was so high. So, but there was huge investment in this flower industry that has failed. And the GDP data went up, right? And it went up because it measured the investment in the country. The impact of this was to exacerbate the, the problems of the poorest people in Ethiopia. Um, it's just one demonstration. I could give you many others of where just looking at one indicator without looking at context, without looking at the, the wider impacts and so on is, is really, really critical. So I sat through a meeting of finance minister with um, representatives of organizations like the IMF and so on which he was celebrating the success of Ethiopia because of the increased GDP. Um, one of the challenges we have in terms of the integrity of official statistics is the, the rise of performance monitoring. Um, and performance monitoring is increasingly used in order to establish what works amongst policy initiatives. But it's also used to identify well-performing or underperforming institutions, public servants, and so on. And also used to hold ministers to account for their stewardship. So it's got so many, many different purposes, and they conflict, and they cause problems in terms of conflicting. Because the government is both monitoring public services and being monitored by them. And so you have enormous problems in terms of the incentives in the system. Because of that, and because of the rise of performance indicators, indeed, you know, many countries of the world now 
drive a lot of their policy around performance indicators. It's even more important that we have good information that is carried out with integrity and, and shielded from undue political interference. Um, I, I worry about this a great deal, and if you're interested in this topic, then this report of the Royal Statistical Society on performance monitoring is worth looking at. But, I mean, I, I do believe passionately in the importance of information for accountability and for developing sound policies. Um, but one of the difficulties is that performance indicators are so often used as sticks to beat people with. You know, you, any of you interested in school league tables, you will know that um, the damage that has been done to, to many schools because um, of the use of those data in order to, to uh, call schools to account inappropriately. Um, and one of the, the huge problems is that they're not starting uh, on an equal footing. So um, schools, for example, institutions generally have different, um, different resources available to them. They have uh, often different catchment areas or different problems that they're confronting. And unless you can take that into account and actually ensure that you've got performance indicators that look appropriately at the, the value add of, uh, of the public service, you really risk misleading in a terribly uh, terribly damaging way. Um, I owe my life to a surgeon who decided to uh, take me on and, and um, treat me for a cancer that other surgeons had said no. Um, if that surgeon had thought that his data on his performance was going to influence whether he could work in the future, would he have done that? Would he have taken on somebody who was very high risk? And we see this in some countries where um, we're seeing unintended consequences. Um, so we have to be really careful, not arguing about not using data, of course I wouldn't as a statistician, but I am using, I am arguing that it's really important that we get this right. And there's many areas in our society at the moment where we haven't got it right, where there are unintended consequences, where data is being manipulated or it's a narrow use of data, um, uh, where there's huge concentration on the league tables as opposed to what the data is actually telling you. The interpretation. So it can divert us from addressing the big issues. Um, it can mean that, that, ironically, we pay less attention to the data and more attention to just this, uh, the, the, um, the outcome of it. Um, I, think, I think we're seeing this across so much of the public sector. It's a huge problem in this country, but uh, I know it's a problem in many other countries too, and it's also becoming an issue in international statistics. I'll be talking about that in a minute. Um, so the whole issue is sort of, of you hitting the target but, but missing the point. And I don't know if any of you have had a chance to read something like the Francis Report that took place. The Francis Report was the report on the problems that occurred at Mid Staffordshire Hospital. And it was all about an over concentration by management on indicators and missing the bigger picture, missing what was actually happening within that hospital. Um, it's quite frightening. I have. Yes, I like that. Mm -hmm. that. <laughs> the NHS target game. Let me move on to international statistics in my last period. So 
what are the challenges facing a statistician working in international roles? And, and I'm drawing very much on having been a statistician working in the United Nations. Um, how do you ensure data is policy relevant nationally and internationally? That's a huge challenge, a problem or an issue that is, is um, ad being addressed in one country may not be relevant elsewhere. Um, and, you know, even within Europe, chairing the European Statistical Advisory Committee, we have these debates all the time. Um, that so much of the statistics nowadays is driven by the international and regional bodies, but how do you ensure that it's still relevant in the particular countries? I remember many, many years ago, it's a trivial example, but it just brings it home to you. Is I was working on product statistics, not the most exciting area of statistics, and I was in this um, very angry discussion where the Greek statisticians were saying, you can't have one category of olives. There is not one category of olives, there's many categories of olives. And then a few hours later, the Irish statisticians were saying, we can't have one category of potatoes. So classifications and how you achieve standardization, harmonization, is problematic when you've got different priorities, different cultures, different environments. So one of the problems is how you ensure this policy relevance at national and international level, or even at local level. Um, how do you define, measure, improve the quality of data received from countries, especially when some of these countries are politically corrupt, are poor, do not have the resources to collect high quality data, um, don't have people with uh, the right sort of training, or if they do have people with the right training, they're not in positions of power and influence. So huge difficulties around that, how we build capacity. Um, sort of a philosophical issue really is, is how you you take advantage of what's done in the richer countries and bring it and help the poorer countries. But how do you do that in a way that is not um, statistical imperialism? You do it in a way that is actually sensitive to the different environments. Um, one of the problems in a lot of the statistical system is Countries that participate and set the agenda, set the classifications and so on, are those that can afford to do so. And the countries that are poor don't actually get to, to be able to, to uh, influence. So that's really critical. So how we meet the needs also, both cutting and training edge countries. About balancing the need for independent data of authority and country ownership. It's back to this trust issue. You know, if we've got countries that we don't trust the government, and the government is what's producing the data, um, how do we get this right? Um, because we want to involve the countries, we want it to be relevant to them, we're often reliant upon them to form the data. Um, we want them to be using the data, so we want them to own the data. We want it to be helpful to them. But how do we get that right if, uh, if we don't believe that the data from a country has integrity? Um, and of course, this whole issue about how you, you're collecting information that underpins sound aid decisions. And this is again about the power relationship. So, um, you know, I, I want to know if I give money to, uh, to Oxfam, and Oxfam is using that money in Malawi or Central African Republic or wherever, that that money is going to be used effectively and soundly in that country. So, 
we're facing in many countries, many richer countries of the world, aid fatigue, where people have been fed stories about misuse of, of um, aid money, and they've become very sceptical about whether or not money is being used effectively. So it's, it's really important that we have high quality information that enables us to demonstrate that aid is being used effectively. To, indeed, to enable us to make sound aid decisions. Um, but that conflicts often with this issue about ownership. It also sets up incentives in the system. Um, and I've been in countries where, in one meeting, the country will be arguing that they're in desperate circumstances because they're with an aid agency that gives to the poorest. And then a, a short while later, they will be using completely contrary statistics to argue that they made good progress because the aid agency that they're working with, the bilateral funder or whatever, wants to be able to see progress in order to put more funding in. So you get data being manipulated and used um, because there are incentives in the system. Um, and so, it's, you know, some of the challenges that you, you confront. Um, there are fundamental principles of official statistics that are really important that help provide and guide um, statisticians across the world. Um, and there's also, you know, debates taking place about how we, we strengthen the capacity of of individual states to govern effectively and how we, we use statistics to inform governance in the international realm and so on. There's a, a really important initiative that now has been going um, for some years, it was set up in 1999, um, called Paris 21, which stands for Partnership and Statistics for the 21st Century. Um, and that is about building the capacity of countries to collect and use statistics effectively. They've done some pretty remarkable work. So let me in my last few minutes sort of take you to the sort of job I had and what, what I was doing. Um, so I was Director of Statistics in UNESCO and the E in UNESCO stands for Education, um, the S for Science and the C for Culture. So I have responsibility for science data and cultural data as well, but let me just concentrate on the education data. Um, so as a statistician in an international agency such as UNESCO, I mean responsibility for collecting data relating to education, what, what data do you collect? How do you decide what you should collect in relation to education data? How, how is it going to help the world be a better place? Um, well, one of the things that you that guides what you collect is treaties. So, um, 1989 saw the adoption of the Convention on the Rights of the Child by the UN General Assembly. Um, I don't know if you know uh, of the UN uh, countries um, which signed up to this and which didn't. There's all but two countries signed up, signed up to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The two countries who didn't were Somalia and the United States. It's quite interesting, this very particular one. <laughs> um, it became the first legally binding international convention to affirm human rights for all children. I'm very cautious in what I'm saying because I'm a bit of a legal mm -hmm. <laughs> expert here. Um, and it, it codifies principles, right? Now, if you codify principles, you then need to monitor that, don't you? And, um, I mean, the treaty spells out basic human rights for children. It talks about the right to survival, the right to develop to the fullest, the right to protection from harmful influences, abuse and exploitation, and the right to part participate fully in family, cultural and social life. Whew. I mean, the... Really important, as a statistician, having to monitor performance <coughs> against a treaty like that. 
pretty difficult. Um, and the treaty, I, I think it's been amazing, actually. It's been a really important treaty, and a huge progress has been achieved over the last 24 years. Um, and there has been great success in a lot of the monitoring, a lot of the monitoring of, of, um, uh, of the extent to which countries have endorsed this, the extent to which when countries have violated the principles and so on. It's not easy to think about how you would collect um, universally applicable data on this topic. The other thing that happens in, re in addition to treaties is summits. Um, and there are loads of summits. They take place every year or so there'll be another few summits. Um, the Millennium Summit in September 2000 was really important. And it was the Millennium Summit that set a number of goals, the, the Millennium Development Goals. Um, I, I was lucky enough to be at the Millennium Summit. It was an uh, amazing experience. 147 heads of state. I think it's been the, it's the largest gathering of heads of state any time. Um, and, and representatives of 189 countries. Um, and you'll be familiar with the Millennium Goals, you'll, you'll have read about them, that these are the eight goals. Um, it's quite interesting that almost all of the debate at the Millennium Summit was actually about goal eight. Um, goals one to seven had largely been drawn up beforehand. Um, and agreed in various committees and so on. Goal 8 was a pushback from the poorer countries of the world. Because the poorer countries of the world saw the first seven goals as the ways they were going to be called to account for their progress. Goal 8 was actually saying, if you're going to call us to account, you have to work with us in order to ensure that we have development. So a lot of the debate was about, about goal eight. It was very interesting, the, sort of the, the power relationships between countries. So loads and loads of, of, uh, of these um, summits, international meetings take place. And like the treaties, they agree to things that um, are really, apple pie and motherhood, I mean, they sound fantastic, but then you have difficulties as a statistician working in the system as to how you translate this into data that's collected. So I'll just show you part of the process. So goal two is about achieving universal primary education. Goal two is divided into a whole number of targets. This is target number three. And target number three is ensuring that by 2015, children everywhere, boys and girls alike, will be able to complete a full course of primary schooling. And so one of the things that I had responsibility for with my colleagues at UNESCO, because we were given uh, these targets to look after, was translating that into indicators. After lots of consultations, on, and you're driven by what you can collect, we translated them to three indicators. The net enrollment rate ratio into primary education, the proportion of pupils starting grade one who re reach grade five, and then trying to get something about the quality of the education system, because in lots of countries, children go to school, but they don't learn anything because the teachers aren't qualified. I've been to classes with 120 pupils in one class, 120 pupils of all different ages. Quality of education uh, is, is dire in that situation. So you don't just want to measure input, you want to try and get some sort of measure of output, don't you? And so in this case, it's the literacy rate of 15 to 24 year olds. Extraordinarily difficult to collect the literacy rate of 15 to 24 year olds. I remember going to a meeting in Papua New Guinea, there are 400 
30 languages in Papua New Guinea. Um, how do you measure literacy and standard measurement when you're in a country with 430 languages? It sounds straightforward, but how do you measure this in a country that doesn't have a decent sampling frame? You can't actually find your 15 to 24-year-olds easily. Really, really tricky. How do you measure it in a country where people don't live an inch? So, huge difficulties, but this is what we were trying to measure. Another example, promoting gender equality and empowering women. Target number four is around education, and the indicators there are the ratio of girls to boys in primary, secondary, and tertiary education, the ratio of literary, literate women to men in the 15 to 24 year olds, the share of women in wage employment in the non agricultural sector, and the proportion of seats held by women in national parliament. Uh, rather strange one on the end there. But it's just to give you a flavour of the sort of thing that happens. So you start with these treaties, you start with these summits, they get translated into goals, they get translated into targets, they get translated into indicators, and then you have to collect the information. And one of the problems we've had with the Millennium Development Goals is there's monitoring annually. So it isn't just that you need to have a good estimate as to what the literacy rate of 15 to 24 year olds is at the beginning. You've got to try and measure it annually. And of course, you're trying to do this every country of the world. And you've got the fact that your sample based data and most of the change over an annual period is within random error. So most of the change that you find is an artifact of the measurement process. So extraordinarily difficult to do. Having said that, they've been really important in terms of giving visibility and at least ensuring that some, some basic data is available in countries um, for all of these reasons that I've given there. I'm conscious of the time for these and time for discussion. One of the critical issues is the measurability of the goals. Um, and so, you know, to what extent are they measurable? To what extent are they realistic? Some of the Millennium Development Goals aren't at all realistic, eradicating poverty across the world. Should we have a goal that isn't realistic? I'd argue it's been very helpful, even though we aren't anywhere near to achieving it, because it's kept political attention on that topic. There's the issue of change over time that I've mentioned. The issue that you need to have good benchmarks at the beginning, that's often forgotten. People talk about, oh, well, what we want to know is, is whether we've achieved our goal, but they don't know where they stood at the beginning. Lots of the goals were about halving things or reducing this and so on. And they have to be universal and coherent. All sorts of aspects of quality of data come into this. Um, the validity and the reliability of the data, um, but all sorts of other things. The efficient use of resources, whether you've got consistency over time, uh, if you're measuring things over time, that's really important. Whether you've got uh, consistency over countries. Um, one of the challenges is if you're measuring the net enrollment rate in primary school. Uh, what's primary school? Um, is a madrasa, you know, would children go to school just on a Saturday, say? Is that a primary school? Um, is a school in India, I visited a school in India where children go um, in the evenings after they've been working in factories during the day. Is that a primary school? How many hours constitutes a primary school? Does there need to be a qualified teacher? Does there need to be a school? What if they're just sitting outside? Um, does it matter what age they are? I think it's in Norway children start school at age seven, and here they start school at age five. Does that matter? Uh, it isn't comparable data, is it? So huge difficulties of those sorts. Um, so let me finish on some of the data that 
might be collected through that process. Um, I'm sorry that this is data from 2004, sorry, 10 years is terrible. Um, it's the last data I collected uh, before I left UNESCO. Um, and obviously, it's about a two year lag, so I, I left in 2006. Um, but this shows you uh, at that time, there are now 62 million children not in school. At that time, there were 77 million children who are primary school age who weren't in school. And shows you their distribution, so half of them are in sub Saharan Africa, one third in India, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Ethiopia. Um, and there'd been a drop of 20 million since 1999, but that was mainly in South Asia. That's where I made most of the improvements took place. You might want to ask me, that, or you might want to suggest how you collect that data about how children aren't in school. So maybe you could have a discussion about that. And then, who's out of school? Um, so it's important to know something about the children. Um, I mean, particularly, one of the things you need to know is whether there is a school. Are they out of school because there isn't a school? But here you'll see that um, of the children who were out of school, again, primary school aged children who weren't in school, 53% of them were female. Um, a lot of people are surprised by that, that it isn't higher. Because our image is that this is an issue particularly for female children. Um, in some countries, that's the case. In other countries, it's boys that are working. It's boys that are in the army. It's boys that, uh, that are valuable to the family, um, uh, fetch water, etc. Um, obviously, much more likely to be rural, and obviously much more likely to be poor. But one of the interesting things is, um, and you will read this in a lot of, of studies, that the way in which you educate children is by educating the mother. Mothers with some education, even, even the very smallest bit of education, are much more likely to send their children to, to school. Um, and incidentally, are much more likely to have smaller families and so on. So, and those two are things that are related. Um, so that just gives you a flavour of the sort of data that's collected internationally. Um, but you might want to discuss some of the problems with that. So shall I finish there? <coughs> Certainly, open my eyes to so many factors involved, which is really fascinating. And, and um, I sort of scribbled down lots of things it reminded me of as we went through, but not for me yet. Um, over to you guys, if you've got uh, any questions or things that are relevant to your own studies. Yeah, if you want to talk about your own studies, that's fine. Um, yeah, I have uh, two questions. Um, the first um, is I have some. Um, I recently had some experience working with what they call uh, big data. Yeah. Um, I was I was interested what your feelings were on this because um, the sense I get is at least amongst some big data advocates, there is the argument that as you get more and more. Um, Data, and especially as the data gets, um, the data collection gets uh, more and more automated, and the requirement for statisticians is actually reduced because you know, they argue um, things like sampling methods become less important, and um, even the quality of the data becomes less important because everything sort of corrects itself and, and so on. Um, the sense I get is that's not such. And so much the problem in Britain, where the World um, Statistical Society has kind of got quite involved in it. But even then, um, you've got things like um, uh, lots of debates about the future of the census, where you seem to be getting people who are saying, well, you, know, you don't need to have rigorous um, systematic data collection 
um, because there's just so much data out there that you can just kind of scoop it out and make sense of it. So um, I was wondering about that first of all. Um, and secondly, um, this question of uh, what duty do you think statisticians have to explain their data to people in potentially sort of simplified ways? So one example is um, I noticed the, the ONS seem to um, put out a lot of um, input graphics uh, nowadays. And I'm quite interested in that because on the one hand it seems to make it uh, simpler to understand, but I feel like a lot of people, um, as this trend goes on, they start to become more and more suspicious of input graphics because there's the idea that if you can't see the data behind it, you know, maybe it's being manipulated in some way that... Okay. Um, Thank you. Two good questions. Let me take the second first. Um, the, I do believe that statisticians and official statisticians um, have an important responsibility to interpret data. Um, I don't believe that it's just their job to gather data and then other people interpret because in the course of collecting the data, you gather a lot of information about the quality. Hopefully, you understand a lot about the context and so on. So I believe that official statisticians um, have a responsibility to interpret data. Um, and uh, that's not always popular. And in some countries, that doesn't tend to happen. They tend to just put the data out, and then other people interpret it. Um, and obviously, when it's uncomfortable data, sometimes governments try and stop you interpreting data. I, I do believe that there's a fine line that you, don't, you have to be very careful not to draw policy conclusions unless you're really an expert in relation to that policy. I and mean, some statisticians, some statisticians is a rather strange term because um, some statisticians are really expert in, in um, the substantive area that they're analysing and therefore they would be drawing poor policy conclusions. But if you're a statistician that's largely involved in the collection of information, say as a government statistician, interpreting is really important, drawing policy conclusions is not. Um, to what extent should they get involved in in producing infographics and so on. I've got mixed feelings about it. I don't, I don't think they're necessarily the people with the greatest expertise in doing that. And so insofar as there's limited resources, I'd let other organisations take the data and, and do that. But I realise that, that there's also a need for trying to get the data used. Mm -hmm. And so in that respect, it's important. Wherever infographics or any other visualization of data is provided, the raw data should still be available. Somebody should be able to go back to the raw data, and that's a fundamental principle. So, um, so mixed views over the, the visualization. Um, on big data, um, I mean, big data means so many things, and the trouble is we don't really have a very good uh, um, definition of it. Sometime, some of what you were talking about, I think you were talking about data that's sort of a byproduct of administrative processes. And that's the context in which the future of the census is being looked at. Given that we all have to have a national insurance number, given that we have an NHS number, given that we interact with government in so many ways, um, government knows a lot about us. Most of the population think that government merges these data sets and has a much clearer picture of the population that actually happens. There's, there's huge barriers or walls around these different data sets. But if you can get a trusted, a trusted unit like, I hope, the ONS, ought to be trusted, the statistics show maybe not, but they ought to be. If you can get a trusted body to be able to bring together the data in unanonymized form, emerge it, and then produce statistics in anonymized form, that's fabulous. 
because the census is only collected every 10 years. And so by the time it's produced, it's, it's considerably, you know, the, the old data is considerably out of date. Um, we've had huge change in this, in this country with immigration, with uh, internal migration and so on. We need much better data um, for planning purposes and so on. Um, also, it costs money to collect data. If you've already got it, maybe it's cheaper to use, utilize what you've already got. Um, and then we've got the problem of, of response burden, or gain, gain response. Now, the census is compulsory, and very few people actually refuse to participate. But in government surveys, the response rate's been falling, falling, falling. You know, and there are some um, government surveys now that only get about half of the, of the sample participating. When I used to work in the government and survey research, we would worry if we got less than 80%. Um, if you've only got half of the population, the error around your results is huge because the half that didn't participate are likely to be considerably different, dif different from those that did. Um, and you may be able to adjust through waiting schemes for some of that bias, but you won't get rid of it. You won't get rid of the bias. So, in that situation, using administrative records and so on may, may be cheaper, may be higher quality because of the response rate. And indeed, if you look in the Scandinavian countries, that is indeed the way in which the statistical systems are developed. They don't have censuses anymore. Very few surveys. They, they use administrative data. Um, there's acceptability to the public of making such a change, um, and that's an issue. Um, last night at King's we had a really interesting debate on privacy versus personalization, and it was a, exactly about this issue about what's acceptable to the public. Um, the bigger data, if you're talking about you know, data from Google, data from Facebook, data from um, Oyster cards, um, data from cell phone use, etc. Well, it's hugely variable in terms of quality. It might be fit for some purposes, not for others. One of my colleagues at King's has been doing work on Oyster cards, looking at journey to work within London. Fabulous, absolutely fabulous. And the alternative would have been to do really expensive surveys. So, in using that sort of data, yes. But you have to understand something about the quality. You have to understand those people that participate versus those that don't. You have to understand what the incentives are in terms of, of um, participation. Um, so, there needs to be really, really good checks on quality. So, mixed, mixed views about it, but I mean, I think it's exciting, and, and I think statisticians um, are needed even more in an era of big data. Okay, actually sampling statisticians are still needed, because if you talk about really big data, you actually need to sample that. So sampling statisticians are needed, but for the interpretation of the use of that information, Absolutely, they're needed. Otherwise, people may make the standard mistake of assuming that that correlation means causation. Um, you know, and we've seen this again and again through data mining that because <coughs> because there are two pieces of data that are correlated, there's then an assumption made about the direction of the relationship and so on, and. One of the things that is challenging for statisticians is what statistical significance means once you get huge populations rather than sample, sample data. Um, I have one question. Um, it's uh, are the data collection and, and managing mechanisms are different <coughs> in different countries. Yeah. And you also have experience in developing countries. Yes. Different in a school, um, 
I mean, the data inconsistency is is so high in developing countries. They collect in different ways. This year and next year, they use different ways, and they, uh, it, it depends on who is collecting these or this data. So, um, based on last, uh, for example, 20-25 years uh, of certain certain aspect of data, I found quite uh, inconsistency in, in, in their collecting and, and presenting. So how do you do this thing? It's very, yeah. There is no magic solution to it. It is resources, capacity building, working with countries to try and improve their, their capabilities. Um, working with countries that they understand the importance of, of comparable Harmonization, comparable data, comparability over time, comparability across uh, across the region, and so on. So um, it's hard graft, really, working with countries. Um, I think challenging um, when data appear to be inconsistent. So it's been really important. And when I worked in UNESCO, I didn't accept the data sent by the countries. I actually did work on with my colleagues on its validation. I was in touch with non-governmental organizations within the country who might have a different perspective. Um, and challenged unrequired answers to questions. Um, and you get gradual improvements. Badging data according to what you think the quality is is really important too, because the data may be fit for some purposes, not fit for others. And so I'm not a believer in excluding data because it isn't perfect. I, my earlier slide said evidence-based policy is about using the best available evidence. Um, and I think that's really a critical issue. We, we need to strive to get better quality data, but we shouldn't set up some standards that just can't be achieved. Um, I think also being, being realistic, um, I mean, if, if I'm uh, in a country and, it's, and there's desperate poverty, um, you know, getting really high quality, nuanced data on a survey may not be my priority. Feeding the children would be the priority. Um, data is needed in order to be able to feed the children more effectively. But so some data is needed. But just because we have really elaborate, advanced statistical systems doesn't mean that that's what every country needs. There needs to be some staged development. But challenge is really important, and and understanding the politics of numbers, the term I used earlier, is really important. So. You know, I, I had a very public fight with the director of statistics in China who um, insisted that all, sorry, the Minister of Education in China, who insisted that all children in China were in school, in primary school. Um, I had a similar fight with the Minister of Education in Saudi Arabia who insisted that all children in Saudi Arabia were in primary school. Neither of those are true. Right? In China, lots of issues in more rural areas, lots of issues about children who are hidden in the system um, because of violations of the one-child policy. Um, so, uh, Certainly, I mean, China has a good education system and, and they have more children in primary school than many other countries, but it's not all children. In Saudi Arabia, in Saudi Arabia, yeah, all Saudi Arabian boys are in school. It is not the case that all Saudi Arabian girls are in school, and it is not the case that all children of the guest workers in Saudi Arabia are in school. In fact, many of them have no access to whatsoever. When Saudi Arabia signed up to the international treaties and so on, they signed up about the children in the country. They didn't sign up about Saudi Arabian children. So 
That's why you need to have the backing of the treaties and the summits and so on, and actually know what it is a country is committed to, and challenge over what a country is committed to. So I just quickly come in on that particular point. I was wondering, is there any, um, is there not a risk that there may be a disincentive to harmonise your statistics if you're a developing country, if there is a fear that uh, if your statistics are comparable to those of developed countries, they're just going to judge you for it. Um, if you've not hit those targets, there might be a disincentive, and you might want to uh, you know, sort of compile the statistics in such a way that they might be useful internally, but not sort of internationally. Yes, I've never known a country that's had useful statistics internally, but hasn't provided them externally. Usually they're kidding themselves internally too. Um, but there are certainly incentives, and as I say, in some cases, in, in either direction, some cases, they'll try both directions. So, you know, some, some aid agencies um, really want to know what progress has been made since last year. If they could put funding in last year, what's been done since? Our own aid agency, DFID, is like that. Um, other countries, are much more inclined to put the money where there's absolute desperate poverty. And so there may be incentives pulling in different directions. It is one of the reasons why you have to have really good links on the ground. It is one of the reasons why you need to have adherence to international standards. It's one of the protections that we've got. These international standards introduced rigidity, as I was explaining before, but they're also really important in terms of pulling into account. Um, but, no, it's not easy, and not all countries are going to want it. Indeed, when I joined UNESCO, I joined UNESCO to dissolve a division of statistics that wasn't performing, and to set up a new institute for statistics that I'm pleased to say is functioning well still. The Director General of UNESCO at that time, um, was very, very flamboyant uh, Spaniard, very flamboyant Spaniard. And every speech he made, he had different statistics. And there was no quality assurance of these data. I was fairly new in the job, and I went to, to talk to him about, about this, and it turned out that what he wanted to do is he wanted to produce a statistic that caught attention. And if I was saying that my best estimate at that time was that 92 million children weren't in primary school, he didn't think that sounded good enough. So he wanted to say that there were 160 million children not in primary school. And why shouldn't he? He was Director General of UNESCO. So one of my first challenges in the job was to actually introduce quality assurance in the statistics in his speeches. Um, and to make sure that um, I, I, had, I introduced a system with his speech writers where I badged the statistic as being checked by us, or I didn't. I couldn't stop him using these, but I wasn't going to badge it as having been checked by us. So, it was, I wondered if being brand new on a job, I was going to be brand new out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, there's lots of reasons why people want to manipulate data. And sometimes it is just that they want to be able to tell a more exciting story. Yes. 
I, I sit on the GETS tax committee of the Royal Statistical Society, which is a, absolutely about this. And last year I was the UK representative on the International Year of Statistics. It probably passed you by that last year was the International Year of Statistics, but it was. Um, and uh, the Get Stats campaign is really about trying to improve um, understanding of statistics. And we're, we're targeting some particular groups because going for the whole of society is a bit tricky. So we're targeting school teachers because they're really important in terms of, particularly because they often have quite poor mathematics backgrounds and so on. Because we've got this circularity, you know, that people who go into teaching often have poor mathematics, therefore the students coming out have poor mathematics. And in the international league tables, we don't do well as a country. So we're targeting school teachers, we're targeting um, politicians, but they're special advisors too. And John Pollinger, through his work at the library, has been in the House of Commons, has been doing really good work in this area. Um, we're targeting the media. Um, so we've been running training courses for the media, and in particular, um, putting statistics into the training of journalists. Um, and I think that's really important because. Uh, we need, I mean, some of our media are, are irredeemable and they, they're going to want, you know, the government wants the good news story and the media wants the bad news story and the trouble is that people don't believe the statistics because that's what the fight is about. That's part of the reason why we've got low trust. So I'm not naive, we're not going to be able to, to uh, train some journalists. Um, but it's surprising how many journalists and how many radio broadcasters and so on do want advice and help and do feel very vulnerable when they're increasingly given um, statistics to report on and they don't understand issues such as statistical significance or, or what having a sample means or, or um, uh, how they compare two groups and so on. So it's not highly sophisticated statistical training, it's relatively basic. One of the things that I'm hoping we can move on to next is governors, because I'm a governor of Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital, and I'm a governor <coughs> of King's College School. And so I see from both of those perspectives how important it is for governors to actually understand the plethora of performance indicators that come out, the, um, the huge amount of statistical information that governments are given, and it's just assumed that we can understand and use it. Um, so I, I think that that should be our next target group, but it's really important. Um, the trouble is that we have this image of statistics as this desperately dull and uninteresting. Subject. And, and we've just proved that it isn't. It isn't. Absolutely it isn't. fascinating. Um, and what's more, not only do you have to be very, very clever, but you have to sound like you have to be very brave sometimes. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. We have to wrap up, but we could have gone on for ages. Good. Thank you.